this computer. There we go. Okay. Um, then I have no idea. Maybe you have a really good um, sensor on your speaker thing that's blocking out the music and the white noise, but not that. I think it was playing for some people. Okay, um, so lecture two, September 16th, we're gonna talk about formal charge, we're gonna talk about electronegativity, and we are going to hopefully talk a little bit about resonance. Oh, um, then maybe I need to work on having music transfer then, uh, if, if and no one can hear it. Oh, some people heard it. I have no idea what the hell is going on. Okay, so it's not going, going out on my side is fine, but something else is weird and screwed up on, on your side. You probably have like, some filters that filter stuff. Okay, but if you can hear me, I guess that's maybe more important than listening to Queen, probably not. So we'll see how far we get today. And this is kind of gonna be our operation, see how far we get, because some of these classes are gonna kind of run in one to the other. So again, hopefully this is mostly, oh, wrong computer, right computer. So hopefully this is mostly gonna be review for the vast majority of you. So again, just to summarize, what we're gonna make sure we can do is determine formal charges on atoms that have a Lewis structure. We're gonna draw ionic structures. We're gonna talk a little bit about ionic structures. And we're gonna discuss polar covalent bonds. And this might be the first time this class where you see anything different. And then we're gonna start talking resonance. And for some of you that is completely new, and for some of you, you will have had some exposure to that. So formal charge, hopefully everyone remembers what we're talking about with formal charge and emphasis is on the whole formal part. So let's say we've got, you know, a gas like trimethylamine. Oops, we're drawing Lewis Stott structures. I will get back to drawing, I will do that for now. I really hate doing this. This feels like I am crawling very, very, very slowly. God, this feels stupid. Okay. I'm not going to draw many of these after today. But this helps us with the electronic counting. So if you can remember what you have to do with formal charge is each atom has a formal charge. So formal charge is a property of an atom. Each molecule has an overall formal charge. So this is one of those times where I'm actually glad there's a recording because my handwriting looks a little bit like chicken squiggles or chicken scratches. Actually, I think trick and scratches are probably better than chicken squiggles. So it looks more like chicken squiggles, uh, but chicken was trying to write. Uh, so if you can't understand my handwriting looking back, that's what the YouTube video is for. <laughs> if it's really bad, somebody can point out, sir, I don't see any, I don't understand, or um, doctor or whatever. I, I don't understand what the hell you just wrote there. Uh, and I will try and clean it up. And then I will also try and clean up my language and not use words like that. Okay, so it's looking looking at each of these. What we need to do is we need to start with is number of valence electrons. So formal charge equals number of valence electrons minus number of unpaired electrons. I was going to write unpaired electrons, which is something different. minus one half number of E minus in a bond. And that's, that's our equation for formal charge. So if we look at, let's pick, um, no, 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 pen, shit. Wow, that promise lasted over like 30 seconds. I'm trying, zoom out, pen, no, no, bad PowerPoint. Okay, I give up trying to change colors. So if we pick, oh, now, now we, okay, now I switch to the hand. I don't want the hand, I want the pen. Okay. So if we pick that carbon, it doesn't matter which carbon, all the carbons are the same. 
we know carbon's supposed to have four valence electrons. Remember that by looking on the periodic table and seeing that carbon's supposed to have four valence electrons, four valence electrons. Um, I can't help you with that. That's what you need to have a periodic table for, and I'm not pulling one up. So formal charge on carbon. I'm gonna try and write that a little neater. Equals four minus number of unpaired electrons or zero unpaired electrons minus one half number of electrons that are in bonds on that carbon are eight. And then that's four minus four. And remembering my junior kindergarten math, that's zero. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Hopefully that was really, really boring. If we do nitrogen, we know nitrogen is supposed to have five. If we make sure that nitrogen and oxygen go in the right spot in the periodic table, which as we demonstrated last class is a challenge for me. We subtract two because we've got two unpaired electrons right here. And then we subtract one half times six. And this of course is a far more complicated arithmetical equation, but we get the same answer. And that makes sense. That makes intuitive sense on this molecule. That molecule is neutral. Everything's got the electrons it wants. Nitrogen's got its lone pair and three bonds. That's nitrogen's happy place. And it gives us a formal charge of zero. And carbon's got its four bonds. And carbon likes making four bonds. And it's got a formal charge of zero. And those click done. Okay. Um, of course, we can have ionic compounds where we start getting charges. So, you know, if we're drawing Lewis dot structures, and let's say the molecule was something that we're going to see quite a lot of, ammonium chloride, and that we asked to draw a Lewis dot structure of that. Well, you put the least electronegative atom in the middle, uh, except for hydrogen, because we just, you know, stick hydrogen on the side and pretend it doesn't matter, and that's nitrogen. And we've got four hydrogens and a chlorine. And now we automatically run into problems because we know hydrogen can only make one bond because it's only got one electron as in the first row. And so its magic number is two. So hydrogen only makes one bond. It only ever makes one bond. There's only ever one covalent bond to hydrogen. If you have drawn two covalent bonds to hydrogen, you have done something wrong. Um, chlorine generally wants to make one bond. It can make more, but it generally wants to make one bond. And the problem with things that want to make one bond is that's the end of the chain. You can't like have something that makes one bond in the middle of a chain. And things can only be attached to for other things because that's how second row elements work. So we're in a little bit of a pickle. And so we can, we can play with the symmetry. And we can get nitrogen like that. And we can have a chlorine atom over here. Now, I have made a mistake. Uh, is anyone, there, there's something wrong with the Lewis dot structure I've drawn of ammonium chloride here. Is anyone in the chat or orally by unmuting themselves and shouting it out want to contribute what the hell is wrong? I mean, what is wrong? Uh, N is, isn't N more electronic? There's an extra electron there. I think Kimia. Maybe was the first, but I think some other people mentioned it too. And I just don't have my chat pane big enough. And I'm super excited about how many people just jumped in. Right. So we should have an extra electron. We're, we're short. We're short an electron. There's an extra electron suddenly appearing on the nitrogen, right? Because if I think about what I just did, I took that makes sense. That's all fine. That nitrogen thing is fine. Then I took an H dot because that comes with the dot, and now I suddenly have three electrons but I only drew two. So there's an extra electron somewhere. That overall is neutral. I didn't draw any charge on that. So we have to give up an electron and it can go on to the chlorine. And so if we're now keeping track, and this is where that whole formal charge thing comes in, is let's look at formal charge. So the formal charge on nitrogen 
is equal to five, number of valence electrons, minus number of unpaired electrons. Now we've got zero. It just lost its unpaired electrons. It doesn't have any. They're all in bonds. Minus one half of eight. And doing really advanced university math, we can come to the conclusion that the answer is that's plus one. Similarly, if we look at the formal charge on chlorine, chlorine is seven valence electrons, minus number of unpaired electrons, which is eight, minus one half of zero, so it's got nothing in a bond. And again, that's gonna bring us to minus one. So overall, the formal charge on the molecule is zero because we've got ammonium chloride and the plus one and the minus one cancel each other out. But the charge on the individual components is there. So you can't draw a bond between these guys. There's no, there's no, there's no interaction, electron interaction between the chlorine and the ammonium. But they are in close proximity. They are ionically attracted to one another. And so you have an electrostatic interaction because a positive charge and a negative charge get close to each other. So there are cases where you can draw these in covalent systems. So if we have another example, I'm, I'm, I'm forever optimistic and think that I can change my pen color. Uh, and I'm wrong. Oops, if I use my hand, Oh, okay, I have no idea what I'm doing. Maybe, maybe I can do it with my mouse. I don't know. Oh, there we go. I can do it with my mouse. Now it thinks I'm a pen and I don't want to be a pen. No, I don't want my mouse to be a pen. I want my mouse to be a mouse. Well, that was stupid. I... Okay. Oh, my mouse is a mouse again and my pen is purple. That works. So let's say we had a sodium. I draw that. that. That's our structure. So I'm going to give everyone 20 seconds to sketch out the Lewis dot structure of sodium methoxide. And I got Freddie Mercury whispering under pressure in my mind. Okay, it's about 20 seconds. Okay, so again, hopefully at this point, we're cheating a little bit, um, you know, in, in the good kind of cheating, where we're using sort of mnemonics and we kind of have ideas on how these things kind of work. And so we see CH3 and we go, okay, that, that's what the CH3 is. That's attached to an oxygen. Oxygen likes having two lone pairs and two bonds. And then I've got that. That's like the neutral OCH3, no charge. And then we've got sodium, which has a valence electron of one. And what I've actually drawn does exist. Uh, not particularly happy, whole lot happier when that electron goes on to the oxygen. So we're going to talk a lot about arrows later this starting to talk about arrows later this class and for the entire rest of this course. It's like this course is all about drawing squiggly lines. And what we've done here is we're actually going to do our first reaction in the entire course. We are going to do a single electron transfer. There is an electron from sodium that is traveling to oxygen. I am indicating that with the arrows starting at the electron and going to the target atom, which is the oxygen. It only has a single hook on the arrow because only one electron is moving. If I had two electrons moving, I'd have a double hook. So what do I get? Well, I moved an electron. And chemistry, organic chemistry is all, well, all chemistry, I think, um, though some people would argue with me, but they're wrong, is about moving electrons. Electrons are always moving. And sodium has lost an electron and oxygen has gained an electron. And we know that intuitively, right? You have lost an electron, you have become more positive, you have gained an electron, 
you would become more negative. And if we look at the formal charge calculations, we can confirm that our math is right. So the formal charge on oxygen would be, well, it's got six valence electrons minus number of unpaired electrons. Well, that's six minus number of electrons in a bond divided by two. So one half of two. And again, this is the kind of math I can get behind. Uh, we're looking at minus one. Whereas for sodium, it's normally one formal charge. Uh, it's, it's the number of valence electrons is one. It's got no electrons in a, in a unpaired. It's got no electrons in bonds. And so it's plus one. So our sodium is plus one, our oxygen is minus one. That makes sense. But in this case, unlike the previous one, our oxygen is actually able to make another bond, right? We don't have all four of the spots around or occupied by atoms. And so we can draw it the way I've drawn it there with the sodium and the methoxide separate. That is completely correct. Or, uh, or you can go back a slide. If you don't go back a slide, you can draw the sodium interacting with the oxygen directly and sharing the electrons. Okay. Those are both correct. So I know that one of the things that gets hammered into um, your heads, I'm trying, I'm trying to try to think of a way, like what the original thought in my brain just sounded really condescending. So what gets hammered into your heads in high school chemistry is our covalent bonds and our ionic bonds. Um, I'm here to say, no, there aren't. There are extreme covalent bonds and extremely ionic bonds and almost everything is somewhere in the middle. And so the first structure here, this is clearly ionic. We have two ions interacting together through an ionic bond. What I've drawn over on the left-hand side is I've drawn it kind of in the convention of a covalent bond. Sodium, ox sodium oxygen bond is more ionic than covalent. Those bonds can dissociate. And generally those ions will dissociate. You stick this in water, they're gone. They're, they're floating away from each other. You stick this in a nonpolar solvent, like gasoline, and they are not gone. They are stuck together and they are making something that looks a lot stronger and a lot more defined. And we're kind of moving a little bit towards that covalent space. So I think the first thing to start thinking about is that just checking my chat window and my mouse is being weird. Oh, it's because my mouse is on the wrong screen. Um, that ionic and covalent are two extremes of a continuum. And we are gonna spend a lot of time in that gray space. And we're gonna throw a whole lot more gray spaces at you with everything else. And I'm really sorry that reality is so messy. Hopefully again, this is all freaking review. If any of this stuff on ionic structures was not review, um, please take a look at the textbook. These are some good places to start. Okay. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about electronegativity and bond polarity. So let's think about what I was just saying about ionic versus covalent and extreme covalent bonds. So I think the, often the running definition we give to students what a covalent bond is, is when two atoms share electrons. And that is a really shoddy definition. I'm going to redefine a covalent bond as a site where two atoms interact together such that their molecular orbitals interact to make a new molecular orbital. And we're gonna talk a lot about what the hell I just said in the coming classes. You don't need to worry about it too much. Um, the questions in the Mobius textbook are the same as the questions in the Ogilvy textbook. They're exactly the same question numbers. So if you go to that, that section, the questions will be in there at the end of chapter sections. These are all end of chapter um, questions I'm suggesting. So when we're thinking about a pure covalent bond and sharing electrons, we can think about this hydrogen-hydrogen bond. This is a non-polarized bond.
and it's non-polarized because nobody is pulling harder than the other guy. Okay, I'm gonna make it a little bit more complicated. Not really. I'm gonna look at an ethane linkage and we're gonna look at the carbon-carbon bond. That's also non-polarized. but it's polarizable. Which means it can temporarily be polarized. There's no universal one way pole. It's all gonna even out in the end, but at any given, I was gonna say a given second, but a second is an awfully long time when we're talking about these kind of things. So at any given atto second, uh, and I don't remember what an atto second is. I think it's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, it's very fast. Maybe it's 10 to the minus 18. It's really, really fast. Um, you are actually going to temporarily have polarization on that bond because the electrons aren't, the electron distribution isn't even, it, it shifts and moves. Because if the electron distribution is frozen in place, if everything's sharing things equally, that means the electrons aren't moving. And if the electrons aren't moving, that means you're saying that this is like, well, your absolute zero temperature is what you are. Um, you don't have movement. Things are always in motion. Everything's always moving and vibrating and rotating and bending and stretching and doing all sorts of things. So what you have between two ethane groups is that bond can adjust. You can have the electrons going. Yes. Bond, so I wanna be very careful when we're talking about this. The atom polarizes itself instantaneously, but not globally. So there's no net dipole on this molecule. You look at this thing over a long enough time period and where a long enough time period is well under a second and you won't find a dipole, but the electrons can shift one way or the other temporarily. And I just want to, I want to bring that concept in because we're going to be coming back to that. So polarized versus polarizable. Uh, HH is not is almost like the one example where it's not really polar. It doesn't tend to do that because there's only two electrons and the system is really simple over the entire thing. And you're saying, well, there's only two electrons in that bond too. And I'm going to say you, um, we're going to break your mind about what a bond is. There aren't two electrons in that bond. There are how many electrons in the molecule in that bond between those two carbon atoms. Um, there's two occupying the main orbital, but everything else is influencing it and it gets really confusing because bonds are over the entire molecule and we're gonna get to that. And then we're gonna come back from that crazy talk and we're gonna go back to reality. Well, not reality, we're gonna go back to our simple model, which doesn't break our minds, where we're gonna pretend that there's two electrons in that bond. But the thing about H2 is there are only actually two electrons in there. And so you don't tend to, you don't tend to get, you get very, very minor. Yes, technically there is polarizability in there, Technically it does happen, uh, but it's so minor, it's not actually useful. It's like the one case where it's not useful. That was a fun digression for me and probably overkill. Um, okay, so let's, let's go to a point where we do have a polarized bond. Man, my, it's like my, my digital pen just ran out of ink. Okay, we have methane chloride chloromethane, one chloromethane. So I'm gonna post the gamification for naming things because you're gonna to have to be able to name stuff like this. And I assume that most of you, yeah, everything you've learned about everything is a lie. Okay, so that bond is polarized like that. What does that arrow mean? That arrow means is, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be a, optimist here and believe that I can change the color. Sorry, just um, can you give me a second, people? Sorry about that. Um, and I lost my there we go. So what this means is 
the bond is pull uh, and I didn't change my color. How oh, well, we'll live. The bond is polarized such that the chloride is pulling electrons towards it. And the methyl group is positive. Yes, exactly. Um, well, this time we're not going to lie to you too much. We're going to, we're going to keep the lies down, Mohammed. Um, we'll try. And so the, that means the bond is shifted towards the chlorine. And you know which way those bonds shift because you have your periodic table. And, okay, this is getting really meta in the chat window. I'll let that happen. If we have our periodic table over here, like, you know, I'm gonna stick hydrogen over there. I'm gonna stick helium over here. And under helium, we've got neon as we established last class. And then we've got, nope, not, yes. Yes, we've got fluorine. And here we have chlorine. And then there's bromine. And then there's oxygen and nitrogen and carbon. And then there's other atoms in here that nobody cares about. So as you go up, and as you go across, electronegativity increases. Right, that's a trend that all you guys know. Okay, I'm not getting into that argument either. Um, I don't think that's gonna be a surprise for anybody. So what I want to make sure is that that's clear. What I want to have now is another example with this. And I think I'm going to skip to the next slide, even though it's got problems on it. And take a look at Well, that, you know what, that's the kind of thing I'll probably edit out of the chat before I post it live, is this offshoot into the unfairness of the rating systems in FIFA 2021. I do completely agree that that's really, really important. Let's say we have a molecule like this guy. That and of course, I can draw it like that. Hopefully everyone knows what I mean. Yeah, those are all H's. I'm sorry, they look like nitrogens. Um, they're my one handed, one do not lift the pen from the page hydrogens. And I can draw it like the structure over there on the right. And let's say I'm comparing that versus, I'm just gonna draw the structure, that. So in one case, I'm gonna have a fluorine on there. In the other case, I'm not gonna have a fluorine. And let's say I wanna talk about this atom over here. I wanna compare A and B. Which of A, okay, so the formal charge on A and B is the same. They're both methyl groups. They're both carbons attached to three hydrogens and attached to another carbon. So their formal charges are both zero. Uh, who cares? What we care about for the whatever reasons that I'm asking this question is what is the, which of A and B have a greater pos real positive charge on them? So the question is, I guess does, I was gonna write is, but does A have a greater positive charge than B? A would be more positive than B. Okay, can somebody tell me why A would be more positive than B? Yeah, F is more electronegative. We're all getting electrons moving away. 
We're getting there, induce the dipole. Okay, so yeah. So what I wanna do then is I wanna talk about this induct. This is what we're, what we're basically talking about here is what's called an inductive effect. which is pulling electrons through bonds. Um, that's not the technical definition. If you look it up, I'm sure there's a much more technical definition, but it's, it's a very, very functional definition and it's true. So what we have is we have the fluorine pulling electrons away from that carbon. It makes our fluorine delta minus. That makes this carbon delta plus. That carbon doesn't want to be delta plus. Carbons want to be neutral. So the carbon's going like, where can I steal some electron density from to get me a bit more neutral? Well, I'm gonna steal it from, you can't steal from hydrogen really, like hydrogen's got nothing. Um, it's like your roommate. So you steal for an next carbon over, which is then a little less positive and makes this guy a little less positive. So this delta plus gets a little bit smaller. I'm not gonna get our ruler, but you know, the overall delta, the size of the deltas corresponds to the strength of the, the amount of positive charge on there. Now this guy wants to be neutral. So what does he do? Well, he pulls away from A. Which has a tiny little delta plus on it because it's pretty far away from that fluorine. But you still feel the effect of that fluorine all the way over there because each of the carbons is going to pull the electrons from the nearest carbon to it to help try and make itself happy. I like to think of atoms, and this is, this is purely an anthropomorphization because atoms definitely do not have brains or emotions because they can't have neural systems, unless like each atom is an entire universe and made up of like other things. Anyways, the, I like to think of an atom as being happy when it's neutral. And usually these atoms wants to make itself happy. They're very, very selfish. And so they will just pull electrons from the guy next to them to make themselves a little bit happier. And they'll keep pulling all the way along. So we have this effect in this molecule up there. This bottom molecule, we don't really have a net pull. Now it's polarizable at any given moment. There's more electron density over in one place than another. But overall, over enough time, there's no net charge around this molecule. The molecule is completely neutral. Okay. Is anyone confused by that explanation? So which one? A has a greater positive charge. Because B basically has none. Is there any more delta? So yeah, the, first, the carbon closest to the fluorine is the most delta positive. And then the delta positives get smaller and smaller and smaller as I get further away from that fluorine. So the one next to the fluorine has the biggest effect because the fluorine is right next to it. And what you want to do is you want to minimize charge separation. You want that negative charge wants a big positive charge next to it to neutralize it because it doesn't want to be negative. And so the molecule the entire time is trying to balance all these things, right? It wants to spread charges around because nobody really wants to carry a charge but it wants to keep the charges close together, like positive charges close to negative charges, because it wants them to cancel out. So what we're always looking for is we're trying to minim, what we're doing here, what all this talk is about is we're minimizing energy. It takes energy to keep charges apart. And so we don't want that. We, don't, we want the charges close together. But at the same time, no one wants to carry a full charge. Everyone wants to spread their charge around because that lowers the energy. That makes it more stable if you can spread the charge around. So we have these two competing things going on. We want the charges next to each other, but no one wants to carry a full charge. And so that's why we get this effect where the delta positives kind of get smaller and smaller as you go along the chain, because you want the biggest one near the negative charge because they cancel each other out, but you don't want all of it in one place because that's unstable. Okay. 
um, I'm going to add some more slides right now, live, while doing this. Let's see if I can. I should be able to figure this out because we've got time. Yes, keep my incantations. And then there we go. So we're gonna in the next um, 15 minutes or so, we're going to start talk uh, so the one closest to the extra negative atom is gonna be the most positive, yeah. So we're going to start talking about resonance. Now there's no, I have no slideshow for resonance. So there's not going to be a PowerPoint posted. Um, I really need to figure out how to use the poll system. I don't know how many of you guys have seen. Yes, if you bought Mobius online, just the ebook, it comes with the ebook. The ebook is fully integrated into Mobius. So what is this thing? So resonance is the delocalization of electrons. Delocalization of E minus through a pi system, which is not as exciting as it sounds, like it's not about cherry pies. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we go back, I'm sure remembering some things of high, um, high school chemistry, and we're gonna come back to this, is if you have a double bond, We'll, we'll keep it simple. I'm going to come back to orbitals later. So we have ethane, ethene. What that bond is made up of is one sigma and one pi. Yeah. Exactly. Pi, it's the Greek letter pi. Pi. So, and this is, and we're going to get to the structure of atoms. And I know you guys have already done this. A sigma bond is a bond where electron density is between the atoms. Pi system is where E density is not between the atoms, for lack of a better term. And one way of thinking about that is you get pi systems because you have two P orbitals interacting. We talked about P orbitals back in lecture number one. And so we can redraw this with all the sigma bonds just being lines, we'll come back to what makes up a sigma bond. And we've got a P orbital on each of these carbons. And what I'm trying to do here is draw in 3D. And I'm really sorry because I really suck. So the top orbital is coming directly out of the plane towards us and the bottom orbital is going directly into the plane, like into the paper. So it's like perpendicular to the paper. All the sigma bonds are in the plane of the paper or the digital paper and the pi bonds are coming straight up, like coming straight out of the screen towards your face and going straight back. And I indicate that by shading them to make them look like they're coming towards you and dotting them to make them look like they're going away from you going away, coming out. I need to figure out how to set up a poll on Zoom because I really want to ask how many people this is the first time they're seeing this and I have no idea. 
Each of these has one electron in them. And together, those make a bond. And I am going to Okay, this, I had no trouble with this yet last class. There we go. There we go. The pi bond occurs. Yeah, but then that, that's just gonna really fill up the entire chat window. Like, I think there's a poll option on here. I just need to play with it and figure out exactly how to make it work. I'm paying Zoom enough to get like all the options. Um, anyways, that's not two pi bonds, that's one pi bond. It's one pi bond because those electrons are not actually where I drew them. They're in the entire p orbital at the same time. And that p orbital is not really there because it's currently making a bond and it's not really a p orbital anymore. Um, yeah, I guess you can put a thumbs up in the left hand corner, but there's just, I have so many screens. I don't know if like I can't see everyone. I, I, I need to figure out how I will figure out how to do this. I might have to like pull in some. No, I really don't want to use something like Kahoot. I really hate that software. So well, well anyways, we'll figure this out. I'm going to assume that people are somewhat familiar with this. And if I get a whole lot of emails going, oh God, I've never seen this before, then I'll, I'll take it back a notch. But say it's just really an introduction like this. Okay. Pi bonds, P orbitals interacting. That's what they are. So a pi system is when you got a whole lot of p orbitals in a row. So let's say we have this molecule. Shit, I, I've drawn in the carbon, so I have to draw in the hydrogens. If I actually write C, I have to draw the H's. That is the rule. So let's say, but you know, at this stage, let's do that. This is one way. Yeah, I could do that, eh? Participant list. Um, I think I need to figure out a way to do that because the problem is I have, you know, my participant list is 340 people long or today 280. Um, that just sounds tough. Okay. Um, this is one way to draw this molecule, but it's not the only way to draw this molecule. Yeah, I just need to figure out how to use it. You're, you're, there is one, I've just, I've never used it before and I'm not going to pretend to figure it out in the middle of class. Um, I'll test it out on my students, my, uh, my research students, because what are research students for about testing things out on? So what we're, what I mean by one way to draw this molecule is what I have is I have p orbitals on all those carbons and I've arbitrarily decided. So I'm going to just redraw that. And I'm only going to draw the p orbitals. And for convenience sake, we're going to look on it side on so I don't need to draw this whole shading thing. Well, there's up and down. I still need to shade because of phases of orbitals and we're going to get into that in a bit. Just P. So each of those P orbitals has a single electron in it, which I'm going to indicate with the whole electron sign. And what I've drawn in the first um, structure here is I've arbitrarily decided that I want to draw that to be a bond and that to be a bond. And that makes sense. One electron each, one electron each. And that's, it's, it's by far the most stable way to do it. But it's not my only choice because these electrons can flow quite happily between all those p orbitals. Like there's nothing stopping me having said like without moving any electrons even, and I'm allowed to move electrons. Oops. I promise I will get used to this. It will just take me far too long, embarrassingly long to do that. And what has happened? 
Okay, I'll use my keyboard. Um, no, don't zoom. No, no, bad computer. I don't want the hand button. Sorry. Okay. Let's see if this will work. I could equally have drawn that being a bond only, in which case the structure I would have drawn would have had one lone electron on this poor little carbon over here, a double bond between the two middle carbons, another lone electron on this carbon over here. That's equally true. It's completely arbitrary where I chose to draw that bond. There is nothing stopping those two orbitals interacting with each other instead. Now this is still is in resonance. I haven't actually moved any electrons. What I can do is I can move electrons. And so we've got three minutes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move some electrons. I'm using an arrow and it's coming from a bond and it's going to the space between the two carbons. That means, and it's double hooked. So that means I'm moving two electrons. So two electrons are moving from that bond to that space between those other two carbons, which is gonna make a new bond because I'm moving two electrons. Now that's putting pressure on carbon number three over here. I can look at a number of carbons. We call them names, but let's just give them numbers instead of calling them names. Which will, this will give carbon number three problems because carbon number three will be trying to make five bonds and carbon number three cannot make five bonds because carbon number three is a second row element because it's carbon. And so carbon can only make four bonds. So carbon number three needs to break something. It needs to lose some electrons. It needs to free up an orbital so it can interact. It's gonna do that by dumping two of the electrons in a carbon-carbon bond onto the next carbon. And again, note here, I have two electrons coming from the bond and where are they going? Well, they're not going to a bond, they're going to the carbon. So the end result of this, this is called a resonance arrow. This is not chemistry. All that's happening is electrons aren't moving between molecules. All the electrons are doing is they're reorganizing themselves within the pi system. And they can do that constantly. I don't need anything to move. Nothing is moving. No atom is moving. No atom is shifting. All I am doing is reorganizing the electrons in the pi system. And if I do that, and I try and write underneath this sign that's telling me to click to join audio, you can't see it, thankfully. But it means I'm rarely going to use the bottom left-hand side of my page until I figure out how to make it go away. Is I'll have a new double bond in the middle between carbons number two and three. Carbon number one, we do our formal charge analysis and we drew, drew all Lewis dot structures. It had eight electrons around it. It don't got eight electrons around it anymore. I'll leave drawing the formal charge, calculating the formal charge as an exercise, but it's gonna be positive. Carbon number four was neutral, but now it's got a lone pair on it because two electrons in that bond came onto carbon number four. And carbon number four is negative. Okay. Um, on the red one, where did the other double bond go? The double bond disappeared. It dis so over here, the double bond disappeared because the double bond became two lone pair electrons these guys here. Would that be unlikely to happen? That is a very complex question. So what I'm going to say is that all of these molecules exist simultaneously. What we're basically saying is that these, any one of these drawings does not describe reality, does not describe the molecule. Take all of these drawings, 
throw them in a blender, and that's what the molecule is. It is the mixture of all of these things. Um, somebody made a, a really a, a, good com a good comment about this. So think about a, a unicorn. The molecule I drew up there in the top right hand corner, or the sense of this being um, the molecule, I've drawn something there. We're going to call that a horse. Unicorns look mostly like horses, but they're, they're not horses. And let's call the other two structures there narwhals. You know, they got the horn, but they definitely don't look like horses. And a unicorn is a cross between a narwhal and a horse, except a unicorn can't, doesn't really exist. The unicorn exists in our minds. And this is where it flips because we're in fantasy land because the only thing that now exists is the unicorn. The only thing that exists is the merging of all these things, but you can't draw that. You cannot draw using our simple little minds how these electrons sit because we think, shit, the electrons must sit between two atoms. That's the way the world works. And it's not the way the world works. The electrons are distributed over the entire molecule at once. And we cannot make sense of that. Like, I, I can't make sense of that. I use that every day. I, I cannot visualize that because it's not visualizable. We have no way of thinking about things spread over clouds of electrons over the entire molecule occupying different energy levels because of which bonds they have to be formally in. That's just something that's really weird um, because we're talking about unicorns. So what we do instead is we draw several discrete structures all of our structures emerge from Lewis structures. We can draw them down, but we have to remember is that none of these three structures, A, B, and C are real. Reality is a mixture of all of those three. The true nature of the molecule is intermediate between all of them. Now they don't all contribute equally. A is by far the most stable because everything, every, we're gonna talk about why, every, but every electron is in a bond Every atom has its full octet. There are no charges. That is by far the biggest contributor. The, the unicorn looks the most like a horse. It doesn't look that much like a narwhal, but it's got a little bit of narwhal in it. And so a little bit of it looks like the diradical, which is C. And a little bit of it looks like this polarized molecule, which is B. So A is not a true description of this molecule, but it's closer than B and C. And we're going to start picking this up next week or next class when we start talking about resonance hybrids. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, you can go the other way. I drew B, but you can also draw D, which would be the exact opposite because it's completely symmetrical. I just can't be bothered. There are other ones you can do as well. Uh, C has two electrons floating solo because the electrons went from this bond here onto four, and so it has a lone pair. Um, if I ask you which is the major contributor to the resonance structure, A is the right answer. But we're gonna start talking about resonance hybrids next class, and it will be uh, what was the true structure. We're gonna sort of show how we can kind of think about that, but not really. If I ask you to draw a small coat, you draw A, you just need to remember that it can exist partially as B and C, and sometimes it reacts as if it's B and C instead of A. Are the electrons in B going to the carbon or the bond? Um, do you mean, so I'm gonna call this I and II, which one do you mean? Uh, this is for uh, Lara. Yeah, there's practice in Mobius. We're going to do more, and I've got tons of my assignments. Yeah, these slides are going to be uploaded. They're always uploaded. The video will be uploaded as well. And we're going to go over this again multiple times. This course could actually just be called like resonance. Um, the course is all about chart. The organic chemistry is all about where do charges want to be, where do electrons want to be, and where do the electrons want to go so that they're happier. But that, that's all it is, is atoms trying to get happy.
the double dots on the carbon. So these guys here. They are a lone pair. Over here, these are single electrons, they're not lone pairs. But this is a lone pair. That, that is a lone pair on a carbon being a double dot. And that's weird. You're not used to seeing carbon with double dot with lone pairs, but carbon can have lone pairs. Of course it can, if it's only got three things attached to it. And this carbon's only got three things attached to it, and it's got a lone pair. But normally it's not existing like the lone pair. Normally it's existing like this double bond thing. Where do we get the lone pair from? It came from this double bond. This double bond became the lone pair. It became a single bond. And one of the, the two electrons that made up the pi bond decided that they didn't want to be in a pi bond anymore. They wanted to sit alone in a p orbital temporarily. And that's what they're doing. You just have two electrons in that p orbital, not making a bond. Yeah, so the electrons didn't move from three. They moved from the bond between three and four. Or what you can think of is four stole three's electron. They were sharing them in a pi bond, and then four went, I want your electron, I am taking your electron, and I'm going to put two electrons in my p orbital. But why? Because it can. Electrons want to move, okay? It's like, why are hipsters going to Cambodia? Well, okay, before COVID, why are hipsters going to Cambodia? It's not a low energy state thing. It's not particularly, you know, it's not where they're going to live. They're going to go back to their, you know, their really expensive condo in a distillery district in Toronto. But, you know, for a few weeks, they're gonna hang out in Cambodia. And it's because they can. Things wanna move. And electrons wanna move. Electrons wanna occupy all the different spaces at, at all. You can sort of think of what we have is, electrons are not particles, they're wave functions. And so they're occupying all different spaces at a given probability at any given time. And your brain will start falling apart when you start thinking about them like that. So let's go back to thinking about them as particles. Let's go back to thinking about them thinking physically moving to different places, but then remember that they're not physically moving to different places and that move physically moving into different places is just a convenient fiction so that our minds don't explode. Um, the lone pair can be on the middle carbons because I could have drawn arrow I only to carbon two. And it could have a negative charge on carbon two and a positive charge on carbon one. And that could have been fine. No, the hydrogens are all there. I just can't be bothered to draw them. I'm really sorry. The hydrogens have not gone anywhere. Nothing's changed. Thank you. That's a really good point. The hydrogens are still there. Sorry, I'm trying to join with computer audio and I don't want to do that. Oh, that worked. There. Okay, I need to run. Um, the, the questions that are on, that I recommend are the questions that adapt to a lot of this stuff. Um, for resonance, I'll post up the questions that we recommend for that in the textbook. I'll, I'll send a Blackboard announcement about those, but you look in the resonance section and you can do that. What I would really recommend is taking a look at using the the Mo um, take a look at some of the digital tools that Mobius has. This is where online learning does come into its own. They've got some animations, and so you're going to sort of see things move. And again, things aren't really moving. Electrons aren't moving. Like, the electrons are everywhere at once, and we're just trying to draw simple representations of their existence. But that can help. Uh, the textbook's going to give you a different view on this. Wikipedia is going to do a give different view on this. We're going to spend a couple of lectures on resonance because it is probably the most important concept in this course. And so we really need to understand it, and it is hard. Carbon three and B isn't missing an electron. No, it's not. It's got its lone pair, and it's got its hydrogen, it's got all eight of its electrons. Okay. I will see you guys. Uh, why is carbon one on B only have six electrons? Because it lost two of the electrons in the lone pair, right? So it was sharing two, and now it's no longer got those. Those have left it, and it is bereft of electrons. But the overall charge in that molecule is still zero, right? Because carbon one is positive, carbon four is negative, and one negative plus one positive is still zero. These are all the same molecule. They're just different ways to represent it. Okay, um, take care, and I will see you on Friday, I think. Bye.